Strictly for the culture. Brothers and sisters, you have seen the t-shirts, the hats, the hoodies, the mugs. In the hands of some of your favorite pro wrestling stars, podcasters, and influencers out there. And now it's time. Visit strictlyfortheculture.ca and you too can be part of the movement. Bigger than sweatshirts and commercial success, Strictly for the Culture aims to build with like-minded people and elevate their position in the world through knowledge, self-love, and a desire to unite. So what are you waiting on? Visit strictlyfortheculture.ca. Do it for the love. Do it for the knowledge. Most importantly, folks, do it strictly for the culture. Look at what we have here, folks. To the only show that matters. The cream of the crop. Duke loves wrestling. And there is no one that does it better than your host. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. The Duke. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Brothers and sisters, welcome back. Welcome back to another wonderful edition of the Devon and the Duke podcast. This is a limited edition podcast hosted by your main man, Duke Loves Wrestling, and of course, the Hall of Famer, one of the greatest of all time, and the head of the Daddy Daycare, <laughs> Mr. Devon Dudley. How you doing there, Devon? I'm doing all right. Daddy Daycare is taking a break. The kids are in school. The baby sleeps, so I'm good. <laughs> Oh man, okay. So you you finally get a uh, a little bit of a break, which is not normal. Uh, it's it's funny. Again, we we were talking about that um, uh, three men and a baby, and and the whole strap that you that you have to carry the baby around. Again, people really love hearing that kind of stuff, man. Just just the visual of this big hulking Hall of Fame wrestler, Devon Dudley, walking around one of those straps with a baby uh, attached to him. It, it just, it, it knocks people out, man. It's so funny. Well, you know, I remember back when I was little, you know, I didn't know anything about, I was watching pro wrestling, big fan. I didn't know that these guys had private, you know, lives outside of what we saw on TV. So, you know, big Hulk Hogan fan and, you know, loved watching him. And so all of a sudden I seen him on the Joan Rivers show and he's talking normal. You know, and that kind of blew my mind. I'm so used to him going, you know, something, blah, 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 and going all of that. And then all of a sudden, he's on the Joan Rivers show and he's talking normal. And I'm like, oh my God, he speaks like me and you, <laughs> but just with a deeper voice. <laughs> I think things that we do outside of what we normally do on TV, especially from the standpoint of where we came from, I mean, the attitude era was like the last of the old school uh, type of wrestler. So I think. You know, people seeing us being normal people just shocks everybody because they're not used to that. It's true. It's it's very true. And, and I I wonder, out of other than Hogan, which like you said, you saw that on TV more as a fan. But when you got into wrestling, who was the wrestler that surprised you the most? Where you felt that oh, this guy is going to be this big, mean, nasty bastard, and yet he turned out to be you know more of a, a teddy bear. Uh, to me, it was the big boss man. Um, and I say that because, you know, think about it. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I'm a Yankee. I'm a New Yorker. He's a, definitely a Southern boy and from Cobb County, Georgia. You know, that's where the gimmick came from. You know, he looks like a big redneck, you know, and blah, 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 that, you know, him and I probably would not get along. You know, that was the image that I had because of how I've been raised up in New York about people from the South. And the movies and during that time, how racism was still so, um, still, you know, alive and strong back then. So I'm thinking to myself, oh, we would never get along. I got to be careful with him. Never, ne never put two and two together. Him being with the doctor of style slick, you know, there had to be some type of connection there. And Akeem doing, you know, <laughs> the white man's gimmick of being a black man, you know, uh, when he was you know, doing all the dancing and stuff. I never put two and two together. And then when I met him, 
the nicest, sweetest guy I'd ever seen. I mean, every time he saw me, he would hug me. Devon, how you doing? I'm, you know, and if I didn't see him in a, for a long time, man, I miss you, man. How you doing? I'm like, hey, boss, man. You know, it was always really, really cool. I remember the last time I saw him was in Atlanta, Georgia. It was right before he passed away. It was um, right after Vince just bought WCW. And literally the talent from WCW that Vince wanted to see if he was going to hire or let go, they all came to Atlanta. So it was like a mixture. It was like the first time WCW and WWE were eating and catering. It was on the same page. And I remember going towards catering after dropping my bags off in in the locker room. And all of a sudden, I see Boss Man. And I went, hey, Boss Man, what's going on? And he grabbed me again. Devon, what's going on? I hadn't seen him in a while because Vince had already let him go. And, um, you know, of course, Boss Man was fighting his demons at the time. And um, he came to Atlanta to speak to Vince. And to tell Vince how sorry he was that he let him down, he felt that he let him down and that he just wanted to, you know, kind of earn Vince's respect again. And by coming there to apologize uh, for what he thought he let him down. And I know he was very humbled that day. But again, he grabbed me. He hugged me. He was just like, Devon, man, he was just like, man, so glad to see you. And I remember he just kept looking at me and smiling. And I was just like, man, he's so genuine about it, you know? And it made me feel good because here's a guy that I never thought that I would click like that with, and I did. You know, that's the the word is out about you, Devon, just in terms of the respect and appreciation that so many of your peers in wrestling have for you. I mean, again, I go back to Eric Bischoff coming on Duke Loves Wrestling and, and just putting you over to the moon. and It's really, really interesting to hear that because it's a consistent thing. Lacey Evans, same thing. Uh, It's it's a very consistent thing when people talk about you. And I, I have to feel that the light that you carry, which quite frankly comes from God, it shines so bright naturally without you even having to try that I think that you're just one of those people that are necessary in a room whether it's a locker room, whether it's uh, at a bar, whether it's at a cookout, whatever. Um, You're one of those people that if this guy is here, then we have a good balance in this room because we know that there's at least one light that's shining bright in here. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to embarrass you, brother, but that's the impression that I get. I'm just happy that that reputation is around me because I've, you know, I try a lot, you know, I try really hard to make sure you know, that that is the case. And for me to actually be able to have that in this type of business where, you know, your reputation is somewhat is everything. And a lot of people don't have a good reputation in this business. So if that's what's being perceived about me, then thank God for that. You know, I'm happy about it. And, um, you know, again, it's just one of those things where, you know, I couldn't ask for a better better response from people when they talk about me. I mean, I think it's really cool. I, you know, I try to, like I said, again, I try to make myself as humble as I possibly can. There are some times where I need a quick kick in the ass, but I think the majority of the time I do okay. I, it, it makes me wonder. Um, and I know that uh, this is probably not something that you talk about often, I mean, this is your show just as much as it's my show. So th- this isn't really an interview. It's more of you and I having a conversation. But in terms of interviews, um, I doubt people really talk to you about religion and, and things like that. But I love to, to dig into it. So, so let me ask you this question. Were you uncommon in locker rooms as it relates to the fact that you wear your religion on your sleeve or is this a common thing that maybe people don't know much about where behind the scenes, the wrestlers are very open talking about God and, and religion and, and moral values in that regard. Well, you have to understand something during the attitude era, we all fell, you know, we all did things we're not proud of, um, you know, and me, especially, you know, 
Um, you know, I did things I wasn't proud of, not drugs or anything, but, you know, I had my share of being on the road and, you know, being with different people and things like that. And I regret it humbly. There's been so many times where I've gotten on my knees and asked for forgiveness because although at the time it seemed like the manly thing to do, you know, I knew that it wasn't. And deep down inside, even though I knew, you know, it was bad to do things like that, I still did it. And I still, you know, humbly ask for forgiveness. You know, I knew I was wrong. You know, infidelity is never a good thing when you have a conscience. And the way I grew up in the in the, in, the, in the church, you know, I knew it was wrong. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, I let the world get the best of me and did what I did. And I apologize to this day to my ex-wife, my first ex-wife, um, the twins mom. And, you know, because I was wrong and I admit it. Am I ashamed of it? Absolutely. Um, do I regret it? Sure. You know, but am I, if it, does everybody make mistakes? Absolutely they do. And, you know, we've, me and my ex-wife, her name is Yesenia, we talk about it. You know, we used to talk about it. And I asked for forgiveness every time I saw it. It got to the point where she was like, look, I said I forgave you, so stop. <laughs> you know, she's gone on. She's got a good life now. And, you know, she's moved on. I moved on. And, you know, that's just the way life is, unfortunately. You live and you learn. So I don't ever want anybody to think that even though I'm on this holier-than-thou tip uh, type of thing now, that I didn't make mistakes along the way. Absolutely I did. But I've also asked for forgiveness, and I also asked for, you know, and I repented. And I mean every bit of it. That's deep. 100% honesty, and I love it. I love it. This is why, folks, Devon and the Duke, this is a different type of podcast. It's almost as if you're eavesdropping on a conversation that two friends are having. And, and boy, uh, Devon drops gems every single week. And I love it. It's That's good stuff there. Uh, did you get a chance to check out the uh, Mr. McMahon Netflix documentary? I mean, it's out. And we, we talked a little bit about it last week. Have you have you seen any of it yet? <laughs> I, I seen it all but, the, but episode six. And I fell asleep on it. I was real tired, but I fell asleep. Not that it was boring or anything. But I had just fell asleep because I was so tired. I had a long day that day when I watched it. But yeah, I saw it. What a way to go in from my, from my, <laughs> <laughs> from my Vince McMahon. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, I, I had to do it. What a transition. Uh, no, but uh, yeah, you ain't lying. No, but you know, I did. Um, I did watch it, and to me, it wasn't like they were telling me any anything different. And it's hard because when you're in the business and you've worked with the man side by side, you've seen how he was, you've seen things that he did in terms of how he was with his family, with Shane, Linda, and Stephanie, how he was with the business, you know, his no nonsense, you know, you have to be on top of your game at all times, you know, I seen it. So it wasn't like I did anything that they said in that uh, documentary that I didn't know already. Um, you know, the one thing I could say that I didn't really know about was the abuse of his stepfather. That took me by surprise. I did not know that. I had heard rumblings about it before the documentary had happened, but I didn't know it to be true. Um, in terms of the mother, you know, the alleged uh, molestation that was said in the documentary. And again, it said that it was allegedly said by Vince, uh, I guess in the Playboy interview. Um, I never had, I never heard of that. So that was news to me when I heard that. Um, again, nobody knows what went on between him and his mom, except for him and his mom and whoever was around during that time. I do know he was very close to his mother. Uh, every chance we were in Houston, he would be late at the meetings to go visit his mom because he had took time to you know be with his mom because I believe she was in Houston at the time uh, before her passing, and you know she would always he would always make an effort to go and spend time with her and to be with her. He took care of his mother very well, so I don't know the alleged um, rumors about her molest molestation with him. I don't know that to be true. Again, it's alleged. There's no proof of it. So I don't know. In terms of this, the allegations that are made by the girl that started all of this, again, 
we don't know. We weren't in there. We're going by what was being said in emails and text messages and things like that. He hasn't been tried in a court of law and, you know, uh, by a jury or a judge. So we don't know the thing yet. The, the trial has been postponed, I, I believe. And we're going to have to wait and see what happens. I'm sure the world is waiting for it, or at least some of the people in the world are waiting to see the outcome of this and to see what might transpire. There might be things that we already know, and there also might be things that we don't know. So I don't know. you know. And again, I'm going to say this. If Vince did any of this stuff that he's alleged to have done, then absolutely he's got to pay. He made his bet. He's got to lie in it. If that, if those accusations are true, but you know, if they're not, then hopefully he gets vindicated and he gets you know tried not guilty, and it's been and it's got to be proven without a shadow of a doubt. But even if he gets proven by shadow of a doubt that he didn't do it, there's still going to be people out there that are not going to believe it anyway uh, that he's innocent. So he's damned if he do, he's damned if he don't. You know, um, but again, I'm not making excuses for anything that it might have been done, you know, because again, if he did it, then yes, he has to, you know, stand accountable for it. But I will say this, you and I, everybody in WWE right now, even in AEW, even in all of these local, even all the local independent shows everywhere around the world that it involves pro wrestling, if it wasn't for Vince McMahon, the wrestling level would not be where it is today. You cannot deny the chances that that man took and what he did to get the WWE, the recognition that it's gotten, and to be on a level that he has gotten it to. So again, it's something that we can still be grateful for and be happy because none of us would be here right now. The dirt sheet writers, all of those guys would not be here today if he didn't take the chances that he did. And they told a great story about how the territories and how he went in and did what he did. Um, the relationship between him and his father. Um, we kind of, I knew a little bit about that because we heard rumblings back during the attitude era, how senior was with Vince. Uh, but they really went in detail with it. Um, you know, that was something that a lot of us knew already who worked side by side with Vince or just worked in general with Vince. Um, you know, me being a producer, going from talent to producer, you know, there were things that I saw in the meetings that, you know, you always heard stories about and rumors about how, you know, he could be in there and how ruthless he could be and, you know, how whatever. I saw it firsthand, you know, how he could be in those meetings. And, you know, again, you can't get to the level that he's at by being, by playing, you know, easy or not being as hard as he was. Sometimes I feel like he had to be. But then there's other times I feel like he didn't have to be with people who were loyal to him, you know, like certain producers or things like that. You know, I just saw things that, you know, he didn't have to put his thumb on them the way he did sometimes. I think there were some people that he, he had to do it with, but there were other people that he did not have to do it with. And I, I don't think he realized that enough. But again, we got to be thankful for Vince and what he's done for this wrestling business. Because if it wasn't for him, we would all be somewhere else not being involved in pro wrestling. Because this business probably would have failed a long time ago. Well said. Well said. And I agree 100%. I mean, Vince McMahon, without a doubt, is the most important person in the history of pro wrestling. Um, and really, he created a, a stewardship of the history of pro wrestling through the WWE network and, and acquiring all the different tape libraries from the different territories and stuff like that. Uh, there are a lot of people who are going to live forever because all of that footage has been preserved and can be uh, harkened back to in one place, which is fantastic. So I agree. I, I, I want to ask you something because there was an observance that my bodyguard came up with and, and she posed this question because Folks like Bret Hart, we're, we're talking about the crazy schedule that the WWF and WWE would have. And there was a period of time where they were basically working every day. Tony Atlas said that we're working every day. 
um, she brought up the fact that it was easier for Vince to maintain the the work schedule that he had because his family was always there. You know, if if Linda at one point was a president of the company, and 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 Stephanie's working in the warehouse and she's answering phones, and and Shane is is a referee and you know eventually becomes a commentator. This is before he even started wrestling. All of his family is there, right? So there's no missing time with family so much because you literally bring them with you everywhere. They're part of the business, which is completely different for everybody else who you got to leave your family at home while you're on the road. I want to get your thoughts on that, Devon. What do you think of that concept of it being a much easier for Vince to maintain his work pace and maybe not even necessarily be able to relate to you wrestlers and even the executives who say, hey, <laughs> we're working kind of crazy. I need some time off to go spend with my family. And he kind of looking at folks like, what do you mean? You know, we got business to do here. What are your thoughts on that concept? Does that does that make sense or are we off base on that? No, I mean, you know, asking time off was kind of, um, it was like in between like, you don't do that. Can I do it? You know, you were scared to do it because you were afraid that if you did ask for time off, you would lose your spot if you had a good spot or you would be punished for it. A lot of us thought that back then. So we really didn't have to ask for it. Even the, the birth of my son, Matthew, I was scared to ask off to be home um, to be there for the birth of him. Uh, I do remember Triple H, I was talking to Hunter and I don't know how it came up. We were at Monday Night Raw. And Bubba was supposed to face RVD that night. It was in Oklahoma. Bubba was supposed to face RVD that night in a singles match. And on Tuesday night, when Raw and SmackDown, when SmackDown was being taped on Tuesdays, but showing on Thursdays or Fridays, one of the two, I was supposed to wrestle Rob on SmackDown. And so the subject came up about my wife at the time, my first wife, going into labor at any time and that the day that we were at Monday Night Raw was the day that she was supposed to be in labor but she wasn't and I remember saying something at the table like yeah I gotta get through tomorrow because my wife is having a baby or something like that Hunter heard about it and got up from the table and went to Vince and Hunter came back to me and said Vince would like to see you and this is when Vince ate and catering with us. He didn't just have his plate brought to his office uh, in the arena. He sat with us. And I went, hey, Vince, what's going on? He goes, hey, Devon. He's like, hey, listen, I heard your wife is pregnant having a baby. I go, yeah, she's due today. But, you know, I am gonna. I told him to call me and let me know when, they're go, when you know, she goes into labor and we, I'll try to get out of here as fast as I can. Vince looked at me and he said, nope, you're going home today. I was like, what do you mean? He was like, you're supposed to face RVD tomorrow, right? I said, yes. He goes, we'll switch it. It'll be RVD, you and RVD tonight. It'll be RVD and Bubba tomorrow night on SmackDown. We're going to get you out of here. I was like, Vince, I'm okay. I said, don't worry about it. He goes, no, Devon, you're going home. He was like, and if we can't find you a flight, I'll give you my charter. And it was things like that that Vince said and did that made you go, wow. You know, because you hear horror stories about people asking for time off and even certain situations like that um, to where he's ruthless. But he wasn't like that with me. He was actually good with me. And he actually gave me the time off to be home. And I made it I made it home in time for the birth of my son. And I was very happy. And then I remember him telling me, you take as much time as you need. Um, you know, take the whole week off. If you got to take off the live events and take them off and we'll see you at the pay-per-view on Sunday. He was like, bring your son home. And I was just so grateful for that when he said that. I was so happy. And, you know, that I will always be grateful for him for because he didn't have to do that. You know, he could have stuck to his bridges like he has over the years and made me do that match with RVD that Tuesday and I could have missed the birth of my son, but I didn't. So I'll always be grateful for him for that. So the schedule, yes, it was brutal. 
And yes, there were times where some people asked for time off and they didn't get it. But again, I can't say that I was one of the ones. Wow. What do you think of that, folks? <laughs> it's it's so interesting to me that there's so much nuance to the story of Vince McMahon and how he interacted with people, how he treated people. It's such a mixed bag, but you know, that story is a hell of a story and it's a hell of an experience. I, I wonder because there's a big discussion going on right now. And you and I had talked about this a few weeks back, black male singles wrestlers in the WWE, uh, for the most part, have not been booked that much on the main roster. Now, I'm I'm excluding NXT. I'm talking strictly SmackDown, Raw, and also the paper, the PLEs. Um, We really haven't seen a lot of black male singles wrestlers being booked strong. Uh, Traditionally, they're they're booked to lose or just not even on on the PLEs at all. In fact, there's a pretty long streak going on of no black male singles wrestler being on the PLEs, which is just crazy. And I know that the last time we talked about this, you said, well, let's monitor it and we'll come back to it and see if this continues to be a thing. Well, unfortunately, it continues to be a thing and and people are starting to get a little bit louder about it. So here's I'm going to frame this question to you, because first and foremost, I want to qualify what I'm saying. You have spoke in detail about your relationship with Triple H and Stephanie. Um, and how they've treated you and your family and how they've respected you and what have you. You've, you've stated, quite frankly, that you're a Triple H guy. So I understand your personal experience with Triple H professionally and, and you know, in the ring, outside the ring, the whole nine yards there. I do wonder, though, the last 10 years, Vince McMahon had booked black male singles wrestlers a certain way, and it seems like since he's been gone and Triple H has taken over the book, there have been far less features of black male singles wrestlers, and they're really not being put in the driver's seat as much as they were when Vince was in charge of the book. Recently, I'm not talking about the history before, I'm talking recently, what's happening over the past decade. What are your thoughts on that, Devon? Do you, do you think this is just a coincidence, or or is there something more going on here that you know, needs to be corrected. Well, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that question. And I say that because I'm no, I'm not really with the company. I don't watch the show as much as I should. I try to catch it when I can family man, you know, doing everything like that. Um, you hear the rumblings, you know, from people, uh, of African American uh, descent, you hear it and they're very unhappy and they're very, un- you know, they're not, they're, they're not pleased at all. Um, you didn't really get it during the Vince McMahon regime, although there was a small percentage of them that, of of black, of black wrestlers that didn't like the way they were being perceived or handled. Uh, but then there was a lot of them that were happy, you know, um, because they were getting the push, they were making the money, they were being the stars. So again, this is something that, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer because I'm not with the company right now. And you just don't know if you're on the outside looking in what's really going on. And that's the one thing I've learned as becoming a producer. <clears throat> you know, if you're not on the inside, then you don't really know why what's going on over there is going on. You know, you have to take it with a grain of salt and kind of hope that what you're being told is told the truth. But again, you look at TV and it seems to be that way. You know, I mean, the only ones that are getting the push right now, it seems like, are the women, Bianca Belair and and Jade. So I don't know. You know, I really don't know um, how to take that, you know, because again, you know, you look at the Street Profits, they were on top at one point and now they're just, it seems like they're just there. So you really don't know how that works, you know? It's it's definitely interesting because in a perfect world, you can be everything to everyone, right? And and I, I truly believe that pro wrestling is at its best when it's the most diverse. Now, it would be a complete lie to claim that WWE is anything less than diverse at this point. I mean, they certainly are. 
you have a mixed bag of all the, the, the fruit flavors in the Skittles bag, so to speak. I mean, you got every every race and every nationality and every religion. You got all that stuff mixed in, every gender, whatever. Um, and it's working. I mean, the company's making money hand over fist because there's so much diversity going on. But ultimately, somebody's going to be on the losing end of the stick at certain points. And when we look back to that period where we had Kofi mania and then we had Lashley and then we had Big E, I mean, we had three black champions, three black male champions in that company in a very short amount of time. And it was tremendous and it was wonderful and business was booming. Couldn't beat it. Right. At the time. Um, Right. So. You look at that and you say, yeah, that's that's awesome. And then you turn around now and you say, wait, what, what the hell happened? Wait, where did that go? You know, but during that time period, where were your Asian champions? Where were your Latino champions? Somebody was on the losing end of the stick. So my question right. is, how do we find room for everybody in a manner that makes sense? And I know some people out there are going to say, well, Duke, that's a cop out because the white guys are always on top. And there's some truth to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And traditionally, that has been the case. So it's a moving target. But I'll just say this. Triple H, you got to figure it out. It really just comes down to that because it's a choice. You are in charge of who's out there and who's not out there. And I'm going to and I'm going to give credit where credit's due. What they're doing with NXT is fantastic. Trick Williams, they just debuted on the CW, and uh, Trick Williams won the championship back, so he's the first black two-time NXT world champion. Congratulations to Trick. That dude is going to be a huge star. He'll main event WrestleMania someday. I, I'm predicting it now. Uh, Oba Femi, these guys are coming. You you already have um, the young man who's from Massachusetts here, who, who I'm a really big fan of there. I don't know why his name, uh, uh, Mello. You have Melo, who, who's tearing it up, and him and Andrade and, and L.A. Knight, they're in a, a, a big feud with each other. Hopefully, there's a triple threat that happens at the next paper uh, PLE. So we have opportunities of growth that are there, and you've built it. You just got to execute. But I'm just telling you right now, it's got to be reflected, man. We, we, we can't have this type of criticism happening because it's valid. There's no reason why we, there are no black male singles wrestlers on PLEs. It doesn't make sense. So make it make sense. It's not hard to do. You know what I mean? Because that's a hell of a roster that you guys have right now. And your black male singles wrestlers are no less talented than everybody else. So let's make it work, man. Let's make it work, please. Going back to NXT, they just debuted on the CW. Um, Hip hop theme song and and a lot of energy out there triple h and Shawn michaels and cm punk and the miz and 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 jade and bianca everybody showed up to give a little boost to nxt being on the cw which is national tv so everybody with a tv uh they can get that channel so you know nxt is probably going to have some huge ratings going forward because of that just your general thoughts on that move there devon i mean the fact that nxt has taken the next step Can we now say it's no longer developmental because of that? I think it'll always be a developmental just simply because of the fact that that's what it is. That's what it started out with. Um, You know, they're doing a great job in getting these guys ready for the main roster to move on and to bring new talent in. They're always bringing in new talent. So that's always a good thing. Um, I'm just happy to see NXT on the level that it's on right now. No one ever predicted it, but guess what? They're here, and there's nothing, you know, you're not going to be able to stop them. You're really not. I mean, it's just going so well for NXT. I'm really happy. Watching the talent that I'm seeing on there, it's incredible. Even from when I was there, they have stepped up to the plate in so many in so many ways. Um, some of the stars that you see right now, like you said, Trick Williams and them, they are going to be, main event is in at WrestleMania and I can't wait for that day to come. So I'm really excited to see what Triple H and Shawn Michaels and Matt Bloom are doing with the new people that are coming up because we've seen some of the new recruits uh, that they have put out there and it's very interesting to see what they do with them and how they get them to that next level. So I'm always happy 
to see the older guys go up to the main roster and get their just due because they worked so hard for it. And then to see the new talent come in um, and start their journey. It's very interesting. Very interesting indeed. And and again, kudos, kudos to WWE. Um, And here I go. I'm going to give credit where credit is due. Kudos to Vince McMahon for telling Triple H that, no, we're not just going to keep this on the the website or on the network and it's just going to be this little thing no we need to put this on tv it's time for this thing to start making some money it's time for us to get a return on investment that was not what triple h wanted he wanted to keep it small and thank god the old man uh you know had better sensibility in that regard because here's the reality nxt is making a, a pretty penny for that company now with this move to cw and even before that, that that last contract they had with uh, USA Network, I mean, this is fantastic. It not only pays for itself, now it's profitable. So all that investment you put into this thing, we're getting returns on that investment. So what does that mean? You have another vehicle to make stars today, television stars today, more merchandise, more opportunities for people to spend money on tickets and show up, better television ratings. You can extend storylines across platforms now. You have another show where you can do that on. It's really fantastic. And I'm so happy for uh, all of the young people who are getting an opportunity like that because it's warranted. And I think the quality of the product is better because of NXT, because there's a place where people can learn the craft the right way and then become television television stars because of it. Trick Williams, Obafemi, these are prime examples. You know, this Jada Parker, who I keep bringing up to you, uh, Devon, I'm telling you right now, man, she is the real deal. I am so high on Jada Parker. I think she's fantastic. I think that she could kick your ass, quite frankly. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm sorry to tell you that, Devon, but if, if, if you got to go up against Miss Parker, my money's on her. I, I don't know if you if you ever met her before or seen her, but she's down in NXT. She's the real deal, brother. Listen. I look at it this way. There's always a table with their name on it if they come my way. That's all I'm going to say. So, Jada, be careful because we're not opposed to putting women through tables. I'm just letting you know. And even if that means myself, if I have to do it, I'll do it. So don't let Duke talk you into something that's going to get you put through a table. Remember that. Oh, my. Listen, <laughs> she, she, she'll she hem you up and do that little shoulder dance that she does. She got this little shoulder dance going on. It's catch it on, man. I'm just telling you, you you, you got to watch out, Devon. She She's the real deal now. <laughs> well, you, you playing now. <laughs> you know what? Speaking of tables, I'm, I'm glad you brought up tables because this this humanoid, this, this pencil neck geek, this 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 yellow bellied, no good liver breath son of a gun, Kevin McIlvaney over at Pro Wrestling Illustrated. He is the the editor in chief. He's the head Kevin in charge. He went on the Foundation Radio podcast uh, with Adam Bernard. Which shout out to Adam. He just got a new position with Sports Illustrated Wrestling. So congratulations to Adam on that honor there. But he was on Adam's show, and he was. He was making excuses for why Cody Rhodes was number one in the PWI 500 and why Roman Reigns was not even ranked. And they were kind of taking a shot at us. Well, Kevin was kind of taking a shot of us, Devon, because of uh, what you had to say about that and what I had to say. So I want to know right now, I mean, are you opposed to putting these these um these magazine editors through tables? I'm not going to call him a dirt sheet writer because, you know, Pro Wrestling Illustrated is a little more prestigious than that. But are you opposed to putting this this Kevin guy through a table? Well, what did he say? Well, basically, he's, he, he basically said tough noogies, so to speak. He, he said that, you know, Roman wasn't eligible. And no, it, it wouldn't have made sense to make him number one, despite the fact that he's such a big deal in, in the industry. And every year people complain and all this other nonsense. You know, the guy was, I think he was feeling himself a little bit too much. Um, because you weren't standing in front of him. I think that's the problem here. Well, I also think that he, I wasn't the only one, or we weren't the only ones that probably said that about Roman. So he's probably getting it not just from 
us, but from other people too. Listen, no one's saying that Cody Rose does not deserve a position that he's in. We were just saying, you know, Roman was left out. I don't think he should have been left out. He wrestled, but he took some. He took a couple of months off, a couple of weeks off. They've done that before, where people have stepped away, and yet you still rank them in the PWI. So why Roman wasn't ranked is beyond me. I don't know. I I just think that Kevin has a has an axe to grind. He has a habit of going the wrong way often. Uh, him and his brain trust over there at Pro Wrestling Illustrated, they'll find the most random wrestler from Timbuktu, <laughs> Japan, and put this guy and say he's the, he's the number one wrestler in the weekly rankings and, and nonsense like just nonsense, just pure nonsense because they like to play games like that. I'm just telling the guy Kevin right now, I may not be able to put you through a table, but Devon Dudley can. So, brother, <laughs> I'm just telling you, brother, watch yourself out there. When you make reference to this show, you better put some respect on it. All right, I'm gonna be like Birdman now. Put some respect, some respect on it. All right, we'll we'll, we'll leave it at that. Uh, anyway, moving on. Uh, obviously, really folks, skin, what's, huh? what's that? I really got underneath your skin, huh? Man, I I just I don't like when these when these humanoids start acting up. I don't like it, <laughs> and, and and I still got a problem with the fact that you never got your plaque, and I don't give a oh. damn what it takes. All right, I'm okay. we're gonna find a way. I'm okay. Listen, that was what under well, that was 2001, 2002. It's all good. Ain't nobody worried about that anymore. <laughs> Listen, and, and, that was and the, big, that was a big thing thirty years ago, but I don't care about it. In the in the immortal words of of uh, Jay Z, I'm overcharging people for what they did to the Cold Crush. All right, the Cold Crush brothers are, are are legends in hip hop who never got the credit that they deserve. They were innovators in hip hop. So Jay Z was like, that. "Listen, now that I'm here, I'm overcharging these suckers who never gave respect to the legends." You know what I'm saying? And, and making sure people never forget them. So, you know, that's I'm leaning on PWI. They better they better do the right thing and stop acting up over there. That's all I'm gonna say. I'm leaning on them. All right, that's right. <laughs> you know, you know how it is. You, you always got the, the, the big guy who can kick ass and you got the smaller guy who's always running his mouth. We already know that's the buddy cop uh, situation here. So that's that's who we are here, Devon. You, you're the muscle and I'm the mouth. All right. So we go. <laughs> we'll <laughs> raise, the eye of, raise the eye of Duke. <laughs> that's that's <right>. great. <laughs> but I'm not crazy like Spike Dudley. You ain't going to be throwing me in the crowd or nothing like that. I don't want to do that now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. We we have uh, some some potential breaking news here. Uh, Tony Khan has been has been going crazy, and he's he done activated all his little goofy uh, dirt sheet buddies. They're all saying, "Oh, big announcement tonight! Big announcement tonight!" So, folks, when you hear this, the announcement probably has already happened. But on AEW Dynamite, October second, twenty twenty four, the speculation is. They are going to unveil that AEW has finally received and have finally finalized a new deal with Warner Brothers Discovery to keep AEW Dynamite and at least AEW uh, Collision on the air for the foreseeable future. So I know Tony is going to be doing victory laps. I wouldn't be surprised if some of these these humanoids start talking trash to us about it and what have you there but what are your thoughts there Devon if if the announcement comes down today that they did finally get that TV deal uh in in the, in the 12th inning so to speak <laughs> what what are your thoughts on that congratulations you know um you know if you got that TV deal then congratulations and I hope you knock it out the park again we've never been someone on this show to sit here and to downplay AEW if anything, we've been trying to get them to, you know, do better uh, to make sure that they stay, you know, afloat and to pretty much, you know, try to downplay anything that is negative about the company. Because, again, we want to see them survive. We want to see them make it. We don't want to see them fall. But with so much of the responsibility that is laying on one person, you know, it's been proven over time that you can't do that. Point in case, Paul Heyman. You know, with ECW, you know, the weight of the world was on that man's shoulders. And it was because of that, I think, that helped the demise 
of ECW because, again, no one man was able to do and maintain what he did. I mean, it was an incredible company that basically, you know, should have been still around today. But Paul never got the help he needed uh, to really, really take some of the pressure off of him and to make that company, um, you know, to get to the heights that it could have really gone to, even with the heights that it did get to. Paul just needed help. And if he would have gotten the proper help that he needed, then maybe the company would still be around today. We would still be talking about ECW. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so look, if it, if it goes down, congratulations, AEW, uh, Tony, I just hope and I pray that you do what Devon just said, get some, get some help, listen to the help, apply with people who are a lot more experienced and successful at this wrestling thing than you'll ever be. Uh, listen to them. You know what I mean? Manage the outcomes and let the other folks handle the nuts and bolts of what this thing should be because you have the talent there. Now, uh, Swerve, who allegedly has signed the biggest contract in wrestling and, and, and certainly, you know, he's, he's on cloud nine right now and all that good stuff because he got a big increase from Tony. He's been making the rounds and, and he was on The Breakfast Club, which is a very popular radio and, and podcast uh, show. Charlemagne the God and, and DJ Envy and those folks there. And Swerve said a lot of interesting things about... Um, Tony Khan being the kind of boss that, you know, looks out for his wrestlers and cares about black wrestlers. And, and, you know, it's night and day compared to what he experienced in WWE and all this other interesting stuff, which look, I'm not going to sit here and try to invalidate anybody's experience because we all have our own experiences and only we and and the other parties know the, the truth, right? Somewhere in the middle, the truth is, but let me just remind some folks of some some facts here. And Devon, feel free to jump in at any point. Um, going all the way back to 2019, I was on top of Tony Khan about how he was featuring black male singles wrestlers and really black male wrestlers in general, how he was featuring women's wrestlers as, a, as an entire uh, a division in that company. Because what I had noticed is that you're only giving us one women's match per television episode or per pay-per-view on a weekly basis or a monthly basis when it, when it comes to the to the pay-per-views, quarterly, whatever it was. Um, the black men, and there were very few of them in that company in the beginning, were the primary losers in the company. In fact, the only reason why Scorpio Sky became a tag team champion, because he was part of that, uh, that faction, uh, what is it? Uh, SoCal uncensored or something like that. The only reason why why he became a tag team champion is because one of the other guys got injured. I think it was Kazarian got injured. So they put the belt on Scorpio because he was part of that faction. So when we start going back and looking at the history, every single year since that company's been around, I and many others have been on top of Tony Khan about the way that he treats black male singles wrestlers. In fact, we, I got direct quotes from Tony Khan saying that they're going to do better. They're going to hire more black male wrestlers. They're looking. I got executives in that company, quotes from them. Well, who's out there? What black male wrestlers are out there? As if <laughs> you need the fans on Twitter to tell you where wrestlers are, as if that's not your job to be doing scouting and things like that, right? So AEW has a, has a history. Powerhouse Hobbs got punched one one move during a match with, with Orange Cassidy. He got punched in the face, and then he was pinned. Orange Cassidy, a toothpick, knocking out a damn refrigerator. Makes no sense, right? AEW has a history of being completely ridiculous. And all these goofballs out there, give them time. They're a young company. Give them time. We got to give them time to treat black male singles wrestlers uh, the same way they treat their white counterparts we got to give them time to give women opportunities the same way the men are getting opportunities we're not to give them time this is the modern day you can do it you're in charge of it so we had to pull and drag tony khan kicking and screaming i got direct conversations with tony khan where i told him i'm going to stay on his butt about this stuff okay folks this isn't a joke so for swerve to turn around now and act like tony khan is a second coming i just want to tell you something swerve 
I hope and I pray everything you said about that man is true, because here's the reality. If it is true, then that means that the pressure that we kept and we put on his ass has resulted in you benefiting from that. Okay, EJ, you benefiting from that. Okay, so make sure when you tell the history, you tell the full history. We had to make that man treat you that way because, brother, he wasn't doing it in the beginning. And I got receipts. What, what, what's your thoughts on that, Devon? Well, you're on fire today, boy, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you are on fire. <laughs> no, you know, and, 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 and what you're saying is true. You know, I hope that, you know, what Swerve said is the case. You know, I don't think we should ever, you know, not pay attention to things like that. Because, again, you know, as a black kid growing up in Brooklyn, you know, I wanted to see guys like Rocky Johnson and Tony Atlas become the tag team champions because they identified with them. You know, it made me want to watch the show, watching the Junkyard Dog, you know, watching Coco Beware, watching guys like that. You know, even SD Special Delivery Jones, who did not have a solid win uh, record, but still, you know, they they always, you know, he was always in there moving and getting, you know, the job done somewhat, but then always failed at the end. You know, when I mean failed, I mean he would always lose in the end. But he, you know, he was always in there, you know, whooping ass until the end. And then whoever he was in there with, you know, just came back. So, again, what's being said is, you know, if it's the truth, then it has to be corrected. Because, again, you're not only representing your company with the black wrestlers, but some of the black people that come and spend their hard earned money to come watch your show, you know, they have to be able to feel like they can relate to certain people. Just like I was always told the reason why Austin got over so well was because who didn't want to punch their boss in the face, you know, who didn't. And, you know, the majority of people back then that used to watch pro wrestling were redneck guys and they could identify with Austin. And, you know, you hear, you know, used to hear all the time how they wanted to beat their bosses up or, you know, put a gun to their head and, you know, make them do it now, bitch, do it now, you know, things like that. So they could relate to Austin in that aspect, which is why, just like a lot of, you know, if you're using black wrestlers to go out there and to perform and to be on the same level, you know, as, you know, your white counterparts, then you want them to succeed or be just that successful. So that way, you know, the people, you know, and the African-American community can come and basically, you know, be in attendance as well. You're not having just one race of people there and not, you know, just, you know, not having just, you know, white uh, fans. You have black fans, Asian fans, Hispanic fans. I mean, you do it for the Spanish community, definitely, you know. So why not do it for the African-American community? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and listen, at the end of the day, folks, it's all a moving target. It's all a moving target. Uh, you know, whoever runs these businesses, it, it, it's logical that they're focusing on making money and they got to figure out how to do it. It's natural to think, well, I got to get a, a, a blonde haired white uh, champion. He's going to be the cornerstone of my company and he's going to be the top guy because that's the tradition of pro wrestling. And then over time, they realize, wait a second, society is a little different today. Diversity is in. Color is in. We got to mix it up. We got to show different things. We got to we got to be be willing to take chances on on something that goes against whatever happened traditionally. And when you do that in this modern era, you're going to make money. It's a proven fact. When you feature women seriously and not just as a, a piece of ass, you're going to make money. You know, it's a proven fact. So all I'm saying, once again, Swerve, I'm happy you got your money, brother. I think that's fantastic. Do me a favor, though. Learn the history. Learn the history so you know what you're dealing with over there. Because the same way that that guy was jobbing out Will Hobbs, the same way that guy was asking where the black wrestlers were because he acted like he didn't even know they existed out there, that's the same way he can turn around and treat you again. So just Well, I'm going to be honest with you. The Will Hobbs thing, I don't get. I don't get that one at all. I mean, he's very talented. He's someone that you can make a star out of, and he's just being wasted. That I don't get. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, 
in fairness, Hobbs has had a couple of back to back injuries, which has slowed down his progress a little bit. But I'm gonna I'm gonna give some 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 inside news, brother. A um, little over a year ago, it was understood that the rocket was going to be put behind Hobbs, and that yeah, I had heard that. You heard that too, yeah. See, so mm-hmm. so it was understood that he was going to be the first black AEW champion. Unfortunately, he got injured, and Swerve was making moves, and the fans responded to it. So they they plugged him into that spot. And I'm not saying Swerve didn't earn it, and I'm not saying Hobbs wasn't earning it because they both absolutely did. But the fact is still the fact. You know, Hobbs was originally going to be that guy. And that was going to be a thing. Unfortunately, he got injured a little bit. But boy, how much crow did did Hobbs have to eat before he was even able to get to that point when some of his counterparts who were not as talented, who who don't look as impressive, who probably couldn't draw as much money on top, how many of them just just got the rocket just to get the rocket? You know what I mean? Because yeah. who they're friends with and stuff like that, right? Absolutely. I mean, you know, again, it's one of those things where I can see the frustration on Hobbs' face every time he goes out there. You know, it's something that's never pretty, but, you know, it's unfortunate that it still happens in this day and age, um, you know, and you hate to see it. You just hope it can be corrected. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, again, Swerve, if 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 we're in a golden era <laughs> where Tony Khan has seen the light, then great. Just make sure you know the history, brother. And Hobbs, keep your head up. There's no reason why you can't be champion in that company. I think you can draw money. I think they need to stop having you do goofy stuff uh, and just beat the hell out of people. You can be AEW's Brock Lesnar. Just destroy everybody. Why not? You know, there's not a single person in that company who I believe can kick your ass. I'll tell you that right now. You know, that matters, right? Devon, a a guy who you know can handle himself, that, that seems pretty real, right? Yeah, pretty much. It really does. I mean, you have again. This guy is an impressive specimen. I mean, he is just he he's pretty much the total package. Yeah, he knows how to talk. He knows how to handle himself in the ring. You know, he's got that what Vince used to call ruthless aggression. And I mean, he's got it. You know, he he's really got it. I think they better hurry up and do something before WWE finds him and decides if they want to use him and talk to him. And then when you know, and once that happens and they make him a star, then you have it. It'll be a Jade Cargo all over again. And and listen, Hobbs is on record saying some pretty disparaging things about WWE, about how they, they took a pass on him, and then he got an opportunity in AEW, and now WWE can kiss his ass and all this other stuff. Let me tell you something, folks. As soon as he's available to talk, I guarantee you that man's going to talk to WWE. I guarantee it. Mm-hmm. And, and why wouldn't he? You know what I mean? Because there's certainly opportunity over there. It, there's certainly opportunity over there. AEW, I don't know. It, it, it So far, no good. So that's a story for another day. But anyway, Devon, what's the best way folks can reach out to you if they want to uh, let you know that they agree with what you say or if they want to cuss you out for having the audacity <laughs> to disagree? What's the best way they can reach you? Well, they can read me at Testify Devon on Instagram, Testify Devon on Twitter. And, uh, yeah, that's basically it. <laughs> I have too many. Uh, my Facebook is private, so, you know, I don't really go on there. So that's just my friends and family. Uh, but that's the best way to do it. So Testify Devon on Twitter and Instagram. And, you know, it's that time of year where folks are taking a look at what's available out there and making plans for their future. We know we have the uh, Devon uh, Wrestling Academy, which is a fantastic yes. investment in yourselves, folks. If you or your loved one would like to give it a shot, chase their dream, and learn from literally a five-time Hall of Famer, one of the greatest of all times, and somebody who actually has students who are signed to major companies and making big money and, and are stars then absolutely you need to check out the Devon Wrestling Academy. Devon, let them know how they can reach that. Yes, you can reach that. You can go to the website at Devon W Academy or type in uh, DDA. Uh, that should show up on Instagram and Twitter. 
or you can give us a call. Our number is 407-790-7800, or you can go on DevonDudleyAcademy.com and reach us there as well. So give us a call if you're ready to take your, you know, next step in professional wrestling and you're serious about it. Please give us a call. Absolutely. And of course, folks, Duke Loves Wrestling on Facebook, on Twitter, Duke Loves Wrestling at gmail.com. Let me know what you think of the show. Any questions, any comments. If you are a brand that uh, would like to advertise on the show, certainly we want to talk to you. Let's let's do some business here. I'm going to let you know right now, there are very few pro wrestling podcasts out there that attract as many women listeners as we do. Uh, and this is not a, a show that's exclusively about women's wrestling. So the fact that we have such a high percentage of women listeners, I think there's some opportunities for some brands out there to tap into that. And we're talking uh, professional women, educated women. So hello, reach out. Let's do some business, of course. Anyway, Devon, it's my favorite uh, part of the show here. Let's get the Devon Dudley uh, word of the week. <laughs> All right. Well, something I read, which is so true. May you never forget how far God has brought you because you don't know how far God will take you. Well, testify. <laughs> take it away, Tony Schiavone. This is Tony Schiavone, and we're just from the out of time on Duke Love Wrestling. <laughs>